My name is Gabriel Avalos, and I'm the content manager for DC Dialogues, a student-led initiative tasked with bringing programming to NYU DC and the greater community. Besides thanking all of our attendees, I would like to start off by thanking Polly Terzian and Tom McIntyre. Without their help and guidance, this event would not have been put together. Before starting the discussion, I would like to provide some insight as to how this discussion came to be. During the initial brainstorming sessions with Polly and Tom, we knew that we wanted to focus on women in leadership through the context of the coronavirus pandemic. This was only natural given that women have been responsible for some of the most notable and effective responses to COVID-19. These leaders include New Zealand's Jacinda Ardern, Germany's Angela Merkel, and Taiwan's Tsai Ing-wen. However, in the wake of nationwide protests against police brutality and the issues of racial injustice in America, we found women taking the lead once again. With the issue of racism at the forefront, leaders like Washington DC's mayor, Muriel Bowser, Atlanta's mayor, Keisha Lance Bottoms, and the co-founder of Black Lives Matter, Patrice Cullors, have proved how important it is for women of color to lead during difficult times. With that said, it became clear that our discussion should shift its focus from women leading in the midst of the pandemic to the significant progress and calls to action that women, and especially women of color, have made in response to the most defining developments of recent memory. Now, let's introduce our discussion's panelists. First, we have Glenda C. Carr. She's the CEO and co-founder of Higher Heights for America. Hi, Gabriel. Hey, everyone. Next, we have Amanda Hunter. She's from the Barbara Lee Foundation. Hi, thanks for having me. Filling in for Maria Teresa Kumar is Brianna Carmen, Director of Organizing and Partnerships for Voto Latino. Hey, everyone. And last, our discussion's moderator is Betsy Fisher Martin, an Emmy Award winning journalist and TV news executive. Currently, she's the executive director of American University's School of Public Affairs' Women and Politic in Politics Institute. Thank you, happy to be here. Thank you. And lastly, we'll be having a Q&A after our discussion with our discussions panelists. If you have any questions you would like to be answered, please input them at the Q&A box below. Thank you, and with that said, let's begin our discussion. Thanks, Gabriel. Uh, well, I'm thrilled to be with you all today um, to talk about my favorite topic, women leading. Uh, and uh, as Gabriel set it up so nicely, women are leading on so many fronts, uh, which is terrific. Um, I wanted to start the discussion um, with Amanda, uh, with the Barbara Lee Foundation, Barbara Lee Family Foundation, um, who we at American University are fortunate enough to partner with on a project called Gender on the Ballot this year. Um, and the Barbara Lee Family Foundation has done a terrific new study, I think that will set the stage nicely for our discussion. So um, I've asked Amanda to bring a couple of her slides along, um, but they looked very closely at women leadership um, and it's called Rising to the Occasion, How Women Leaders Prove They Can Handle a Crisis. And it's a, it's a look at basically how women are leading and how women are leading through a crisis and what those characteristics are and what we can learn from that. Um, and then what candidates actually need to know about that as they uh, think about running and holding elected office. Um, so let me um, turn it over to Amanda for a few minutes to set the table for us and uh, give us an overview of their findings. Thanks, Betsy. And at the Barbara Lee Family Foundation, we've been doing nonpartisan research for over 20 years now on the obstacles and opportunities women face when they seek office. So just a couple of thoughts to frame our findings. As you can see, women are still vastly underrepresented at all levels of executive leadership in the United States. We've only had 44 women governors, but we've had more than 2,300 male governors. And while we've had three women of color governors, we've never had a black woman governor in this country and only have had one openly LGBTQ women governor. And a couple of kind of broader facts about women's challenges and opportunities in executive office. Some of the obstacles that women face, and we'll see this kind of refrained in our new research, are qualifications. Men are assumed to be qualified and women have to prove they're qualified over and over. 
And we also know that voters will not support a woman candidate that they do not like, even if they believe she's qualified, but they will vote for a man they do not like if they believe he's qualified. And finally, honesty and ethics. Well, women are put on this character pedestal and expected to be more trustworthy, that is sometimes a liability. Where women have opportunities, and we see this in the new research, are being a 360 degree candidate, really bringing the whole of their experience to a situation, being able to show strength versus toughness. Voters want a woman who is strong enough to handle a challenge, and we'll see this in the new research as well, but they don't want a woman that is too tough. Women have to satisfy both gender stereotypes when they seek executive office. And finally, voters like a sense of humor. They want a woman that doesn't take herself too seriously. So in our latest research, as Betsy said, we looked at how voters respond to women leaders handling a crisis. And that's because our previous research found that voters assess women's electability using can handle a crisis as a top metric. So you can see here how important it was for voters that when we tested a variety of different women from different backgrounds, hypothetical women candidates, that they be able to handle a crisis. And what we found in this new research is that voters know what type of leader they want in a crisis. They want a woman who can take a 360 degree view, and later we'll talk about some examples, rather than someone that can come in and laser focus on one issue, a woman that can really see the full picture and might identify things that other folks hadn't thought about, looking at different populations. And voters really see communication as essential, but as a two-way street. They want a woman who not just listens to experts, but also listens to affected populations. Voters know that women have empathy, and we're certainly seeing that across the country with all the women governors and mayors that are leading right now. And women have to do more to prove they can handle a crisis, going back to the fact that women are not assumed to be qualified. Voters worry that women can't be strong, confident, and decisive. They want to see those dimensions in time of crisis, which I would argue we've been seeing lately across the country. And voters want a team captain. They want a woman who takes responsibility and accountability, but also shares responsibility and works with a team. So voters really want a plan. When you look at that word cloud on the left, that was the word that came up the most in our focus groups. And they don't just want a woman with a plan for the current moment. They want someone that can see what's coming around the corner. It's very important for women to be able to communicate that they've thought through multiple scenarios. And then, of course, what traits voters think women leaders need to handle a crisis. As we kind of talked about, they really want a good communicator who listens to experts, who's confident, calm, brings people together, transparent, strong, and empathetic. So it's important to note that, unfortunately, women don't get to decide what type of crisis they have to handle when they're in leadership, and the odds are that most leaders are going to have to handle at least one kind of crisis, but we really found some common threads when it comes to communication, accountability, and listening. And in focus groups, voters really wanted a woman who was willing to take ownership and take accountability. So handling a crisis might seem vague at some point, but voters do have very concrete ideas when it comes to what they want to see from women. So it's important for women to highlight their track record as a problem solver and really show their ability to build and execute a plan and take a 360 degree view. So I hope this was a helpful overview and we can certainly talk in more detail as we go forward. Great, Amanda, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, very interesting. I want to just open with a question to um, everyone on the panel of how we reflect on the last couple of months um, of the different um, issues that have gone on in the state, certainly COVID, uh, certainly the Black Lives Matter and some of the protests. And as Gabriel mentioned at the beginning, we've seen so many le women leaders um, step up um, and here in the United States and obviously uh, around the world. And so I'd just like to get your thoughts, uh, first of all, on how um, each of you ha have seen the last couple months and how this, the various crises that we are going through in the States here um, has changed the perception of what strong leadership looks like, especially as it pertains to women. Um, Glenda, could I start with you on that? 
Sure. Um, and so, you know, Black women in America actually have historically put more into our democracy and into our country than what we actually get back, right? So the 23 million Black women in this country are underrepresented and underserved. And so what um, COVID-19 has um, um, shed a light on are two things. The continued racial disparities mm -hmm. um, around um, the um, um, income in disparity, um, disparities, health, um, questions in regards to black women being many of women and particularly black women and women of color being the essential workers that still had to leave their homes uh, and work during the pandemic that you've seen everyday black women leading in this moment. We are the defenders of our homes, our communities and, and our democracy. But we also saw a rise in a discussion around black women's elected leadership. And so in 2014, we do a lot of work with the Center for American Women in Politics, partnering with the Barbara Lee Foundation around the status of black women in American politics. So in 2014, there were only two black women elected in serving as mayors of top 100 cities. We now have six. Um, and so over the last six months, we've seen those black women boldly leading, like the mayor of DC, Mayor Bowser, the mayor of Atlanta, um, right. Lance Bottoms, and frankly, London Bree, who was one of the, you know, California was very early in their, um, um, in their um, asking people to social distance and stay at home. And so was her leadership in San Francisco. Uh, if you look at Congress, um, in 2000, we have a record number of black women currently serving in Congress. Um, in 2018, we elected five new black women um, on the anniversary of Shirley Chisholm, um, the 50th anniversary of Shirley Chisholm being elected as the first black woman to ever serve in that body. And so what you've seen is, you know, Higher Heights, you know, our work is around centering black women's political leadership. Um, and yes, we in, um, want to ensure that there are more black women electing, elected on the local, statewide, and national level. Um, but at the end of the day, it's also electing the right leadership. And so let's just look at the freshman class in Congress. So not only did we elect, you know, a um, the largest number of Black women in Congress, we sent a nurse, Lauren Underwood, right. a teacher, Johanna Hayes, um, a city council member um, who has um, unique experience um, governing on a local level in Ayanna Presley. We sent a state legislator and a Somalian refugee, um, Ilhan Omar, and we sent a mother of a slain Black boy, um, Lucy McBath, to Congress. Those five black women are uniquely positioned to bring those experiences to the decision making table. At a time that we're talking about how do we handle a global health pandemic, you have a health professional sitting at that table. When we're talking about how do we educate every child, um, regardless of race and ethnicity and social economic background, not only did we send a teacher, we sent the 2016 Teacher of the Year to sit at that decision making table. Um, and then you take Ayana and her unique experience from a government perspective around racial disparities has risen in a voice in regards to that. Then enter in um, the what I call the tipping point around the attack on Black lives, lives with the killing of George Floyd, uh, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, that you now have a woman who has lost a child not only to gun violence, but racially motivated gun violence as we talk about um, breaking down and um, 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 reimagining the criminal justice system, um, sensible gun reform, and systemic racism in Lucy McBath. Great, thank you. That's a terrific overview. And I, this, even the statistics just on the, the women mayors is um, terrific on how many more women of colors are actually leading uh, leading cities now. Also, my um, I'm from New Orleans, and um, the mayor down there, uh, Latoya Cantrell, is also doing um, a really great job on uh, dealing with a lot of issues uh, in the city there too. Um, let me um, ask Brianna for her insights on um, how women are leading uh, during the crises that we are going through uh, here in the states. Hi everyone. Yes. So I would love to look at this at a few levels. So. You know, at the local level, Voto Latino has been registering voters. We're a voter registration nonprofit that's been around for 15 years. And really, as all of these crises have come to light, how everyone has been suffering with them, people at home are struggling with, you know, losing their jobs, not being able to put food on the table, not having access to healthcare that they need in the middle of a 
global pandemic, we've seen a lot of power come from the local level where individuals in their homes, a lot of the people who were registering to vote are young women of color. Um, over 60% of people that we register to vote um, are women, over half are individuals of color. So we're seeing people really want to come to the fr forefront and be able to speak for themselves, raise their voice, get registered. And the exciting thing there is that we know in the Latinx community, we have a multi-general relationship multi-generational relationships. So, you know, someone might be living in a multi-generational home and that young person who's getting registered to vote, who is realizing that they have the opportunity to speak up against these challenges where they're not seeing leadership at the national level or at, you know, local level, state levels in different communities where they live in, they're influencing their family members to get registered, to go out and vote in primaries and they're coming full force in November. So that is incredible. and. During Amanda's presentation, she talked about empathy. I personally have been so impressed and so in awe with how Jacinda Arden has been leading her community, her nation in New Zealand. And it was incredible to see her engage in Facebook Live conversations where she is putting her toddler to bed. She is inviting you open into her open home to talk about this challenge, to face it in an incredibly strong way, to share facts, to be a member of the community who's reliable, and to also bring in empathy as a leader to acknowledge that this is a challenge, this is something that everyone is going through, and this is why we're with you. And it's been incredible to see where women leaders who are tackling this COVID crisis have seen less deaths in their communities and are actually being able to reopen. So I think, you know, women leadership is absolutely the way to go and women leadership of color as well. Amanda, let me ask you, because we talk about this a lot, some of the qualities that women leaders um, show issues, compassion and humility, um, collaboration. We've kind of seen all those front and center now. What do you think um, collectively um, the impact of that is going to be on the future in terms of electing women leaders? Well, what's really interesting about 2020 is we all thought this would be a year we were all focused on the presidency. And, mm -hmm. it, and in a lot of ways, we've been focused on governors and mayors. And we've seen women mayors and women governors lead the charge in a lot of ways, not just through the COVID-19 crisis, but also in the the racial justice crisis that has resulted after the uprisings in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and so many others. And Barbara Lee, our founder, started doing this work because she thought that seeing more women in executive leadership would inspire more women to run for office. And so many women around the country have been on center stage and really challenging stereotypes that voters hold about women in executive office because these women have been decisive, they've been strong. We've seen mayors from cities across the country stand up to tough criticism and women governors like Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan. Mayor Lightfoot in Chicago was very early and decisive in closing down the city and also reaching out to underserved populations. And as Glinda said, Mayor Breed in San Francisco is a really great example of a 360 degree candidate thinking about the impact that COVID-19 had on folks in public housing, for example, that maybe an older straight white man wouldn't have that as a first thought. And there are so many examples across the country that we've seen from particularly women of color mayors. Mayor Lovely Warren in Rochester, New York was coordinating with schools to make sure that food insecure children were able to eat. She distributed over 800,000 meals, but she also mailed 480,000 masks to seniors. So not just identifying a problem, but finding a solution and solving the problem early. And some folks have asked, what about all of the, the backlash and the criticism that we've seen? And we certainly have from a number of the women leaders across the country, and certainly some of that comes from misogyny. But I think what's important is that these women are too focused on problem solving to be daunted by criticism. And we've certainly seen that with Mayor Bowser in Washington, D.C., for example, not just standing up for the district during the COVID crisis to make sure that it received its fair share of federal funding, but certainly in response to the uprisings in D.C. and painting the Black Lives Matter mural and not being daunted by the very personal criticism that she faced from our president and others. 
And so I think all of these women are defying these long held stereotypes and hopefully will change the minds of voters across the country. And there's a whole generation of young people that will never remember a time that women leaders were not on center stage being strong and decisive. Um, Glenda, I wanna ask, pick up on the points that um, Amanda made there. Uh, Politico had a big piece last week about the spotlight and the challenges that go along with um, some of the big city mayors uh, who are black women. Um, I know you've said that sort of our leadership was built for this moment. Um, but I just wanna read a quote from uh, Michael Nutter, who of course was the former mayor of Philadelphia because he talked about some of those challenges. Um, he said, there's always added pressure on black mayors dealing with public safety issues because you're caught in the middle. Black communities want to be safe, but they don't want to be abused. And as a black mayor, you have to be able to deliver both of those messages, with, which at times might be at odds which, with each other. Can you talk about how some of these um, black mayors have kind of been able to um, rise to those challenges and kind of find that that important middle ground? I'm back. Oh, okay. Could you hear my question? Uh, or did you freeze? I couldn't. I tell. froze. Sorry. <laughs> I heard Mayor Nutter. You gotta love love technology. <laughs> let me let me just reread Mayor Nutter for, for you. Um, okay, he said there's always added pressure on Black mayors dealing with public safety issues. Um, black communities want to be safe, but they don't want to be abused. And as a Black mayor, you have to be able to deliver both of those messages, which at times might be at odds with with each other. How have these women been able to do that? Yeah. Well, I think it's two things. One, um, women are held to a higher standard in our leadership, mm -hmm. um, and particularly women of color and Black women. And so we, as citizens, we're not going to always agree or disagree with our elected leaders 100% of the time. I do think that, um, you know, at the end of the day, these, um, particularly using mayors as an example, they are representing an entire city, um, different constituencies, uh, different, you know, spectrums around the political ideology and approach to things. And um, I do believe that, you know, at the end of the day, there is, there is a strain in being able to be a leader and balance that. I do believe that Black leaders uh, and Black women leaders um, govern in a way where it, it is um, inviting people to the table for a discussion, even when you disagree, right? And so when you look at the coverage, there's been, you know, Keisha Lance Bottoms will probably be a case study that um, Amanda and the folk or um, Barbara Lee Foundation and other researchers will do because it goes from her being applauded from how she's handling COVID-19 to um, her varying um, um, uh, reactions to the way she is governing around um, protests. Um, you know, in, in one, one given media cycle to be like she, you know, the, the, after George Floyd's killing um, and the, the death of um, Rayshard, um, I can't think of his last name right now, Rayshard, that they were swiftly, the, the, the police chief was resigned to then her and her on um, people's backlash around how she handled the protest. So I think it is a delicate balance. Um, it is it is what elected leaders sign up for, right? Um, and I think the way women lead uh, in the research that Amanda just um, presented shows that even when there's a disagreement, that there is a platform for there to be direct conversations and engagements with citizens that oftentimes you don't see with our male counterparts. Mm -hmm. Um, Brianna, let me ask you, um, just looking forward as we think about 2020 and so much of the work that you all do, uh, and of course Glenda at Higher Heights as well, in terms of motivating uh, women of color to turn out, um, <clears throat> specifically with Latina women, um, you all just did a poll that I was reading about um, that measured enthusiasm among um, Latinas in battleground states. Um, that had somewhat of um, a disconcerting finding for you guys because um, it showed that only 46% of Latino voters under 30 
said that they plan to vote. Um, and Maria Teresa uh, was quoted in the piece. She said, the reason it's a code red, and she, she used that term, is that unlike African-American households where older family members encourage young people to go vote, in our households, it's the opposite. Um, and how do you tackle that issue of motivating um, young Latina women, uh, especially to go out and to engage in the political process? So I remember looking over at that poll and, you know, internally we've been having conversations. This is a code red and there are a few reasons why. We see that young people, young women, um, individuals who we engage with, they are not excited about the presidential ticket where usually you'll have people go out because they're really um, motivated by this person who's leading the ticket and they'll vote down ballot. We're not seeing that and I think Maria Teresa was right to frame it as a code red, where as individuals as part of our community, our elders look to us to really engage them, share information, share education on voting, you know, registering different members of our family. I've registered members of my own family this summer for the first time, which has been really exciting. But it is something that, you know, we're thinking of and acknowledging where it really is full court press and everyone's hands on deck to acknowledge this challenge where it's a mix of voter education sharing other reasons why voting is important why it matters to you how it impacts your life tying it to the protests and all of the uh, civic challenges that we've been seeing tying it back to things that you face in your daily life whether you're seeing your family members you know have to pay out of pocket for a coronavirus tests not being able to access them dealing with child care where you're unsure where you're leaving your child as you go to your essential worker job. So for us, it really is educating voters, making sure that they know what's at stake and really engaging around local candidates who you are seeing be the leaders in their community who are really motivating and encouraging people to get out and vote, support them because they're on the ticket later on this year and you're able to see yourself in them at the local level. Um, Glenda, you sort of embody that spirit because um, I know there's a great story you have of your mother um, when you turned 18, her gift to you was taking you to register to vote, right? <laughs> so how important has that been um, for women of an older generation um, in the Black community to um, lead in such a way and help inspire uh, younger women to, par to participate in the process? Yeah. Um, yeah, so part of that story is also that I am the great granddaughter of Carrie Lee Dickens. Um, and so she was born in 1895. I'm a solid for y'all. I listen, I'm a solid Gen Xer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my great grandmother was born in 1895. And so I had my great grandmother, grandmother, and mother who lived in a 15 mile radius until I was 25 before they, you know, my great grandmother died at um, a shy of 100. Wow. So I was able to, you know, important for me, able to actually be in communication and touch women that actually didn't have a right to vote, um, but used their political activism in a way that changed the, the trajectory of, 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 you know, two to three generations of individuals. Um, that's my story and that's what motivates me. And so the question is, how do you then broaden a conversation around how do you motivate um, voters um, across the age spectrum and the, uh, and the ideology? And so for me, it is um, this tradition of black women you'll hear, um, um, Kamala Harris talk about this year, one of the traditions around, around Afro-Americans is also you went to the polls with your parents or your grandparents, right? We actually, you hear stories of people dressing up and going that it was, it was, a, a, it was an activity. And so with COVID-19 and re-envisioning how we're voting, right? Um, voting in person, safe with a mask and with social distancing. So you may not be bringing your family to vote. Um, or your, you know your young children for that that generational piece, um, and many of us will be voting you know by paper by mail. That it is about still creating that generate um, that that um, that tradition. And so you you'll hear Senator Kamala Harris talk about you know we can all get dressed and go to the mailbox or to the post office or you know um, put it into the mailbox. Um, and I think that is in, important that we know the historical piece um, to um, the. The, the, the storied history around African-Americans in voting on the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. Um, that is a um, complex discussion among women of color 
um, around celebrating, you know, in, um, uh, August 18th or August will be the celebration. So being able to understand how black women fit that role. And frankly, we're suffragists that help to move, um, move voting um, for frankly white women in a way that we are again giving more to, the, to our democracy than we get back. So what I think in this year will, will, will be a motivating factor for black women across social economic backgrounds, around geographic, um, geographical locations, around age, is that we're demanding our return on our voting investment. And that is in the form of policies that directly center black women, our families and our community. And we're claiming seats at decision-making table. And I think those are the message that, that will motivate um, um, black women knowing that their vote um, will help to build an America that we can all believe in. Amanda, let me um, ask you, we did a, um, a partnership with you all um, on gender on the ballot where we looked at women's political participation. And one of the things that we found in there is that it, women are participating more and more and they're becoming very engaged. They're contributing to campaigns. They are working on campaigns. They're volunteering. Um, they're talking to their friends. We do that very well. Um, talk about how important that process is uh, for women to increasingly have more of a, a voice in uh, political discussions and elections. Yeah, absolutely. And that research was really interesting um, that Betsy's talking about that we did as part of our Gender on the Ballot project with Benenson, because we found that anecdotally, we, we've seen across the country, right, since the Women's March in 2017, women just seem to be more politically activated. This confirmed what we thought was true. Women are reporting that they're more politically activated. Women are also reporting that they show no signs of slowing down. They plan to maybe only become more politically activated. And millennial women and women of color in particular are leading the charge when it comes to political activation. And we did this research last year, so this was far before all of the changes that we've seen in our country. And yet it still remains true when you look at the protests and uprisings that have happened across the country and a lot of women speaking out about the disparities that have been exposed through the COVID crisis. An interesting part of that research too that, that we found was that the barrier that women reported for not becoming more involved was because they didn't feel like they were informed enough, even though they reported consuming the same amount of media that men did. So there's kind of a confidence gap with some women, which we see in other situations and in other industries where women feel like they have to be overprepared in order to come to the table and men don't have that same barrier. And the same goes for women running, right? They, they feel that they have to be overqualified. And in some ways, the women that are elected are more qualified because of their self-selecting into that group. Right. And also because women have to work so much harder to get elected that right. they are so accomplished by the time that they get there. And when, when you look around at, at a number of the women that were elected in 2018, we certainly saw that. Um, Glenda, I wanted to get your thoughts, too, on um, the vice presidential pick, um, because you know, I, wish, I wish it would just go ahead and happen already. <laughs> I'm sure you do, too. It's who's up, who's down, who's in, who's out. Um, you've been very um, outspoken on this issue in terms of the importance um, that you feel um, of the vice president, uh, vice president Biden picking a woman of color um, for the ticket. Can you expand on your thoughts on that and, um, and the significance uh, of a vice presidential pick and what, what that would mean uh, for women of color? Yeah. And so I would start with, yes, uh, this has been the longest conversation <laughs> around a vice president in at least uh, the, the, the time span that I've been studying yeah. <laughs> uh, democracy. At the end of the day, um, all of the women that are on this list are qualified and ready to lead day one, right? And so it'll be up to the presumptive, you know, um, Demo the Democratic nominee to determine who he thinks will enhance his, his um, ticket in his administration. But let's be clear, we have scrutinized every single one of those women on the list, one, frankly, more than we have the actual nominee <laughs> on issues. And I don't think there's ever been this much coverage or this much discussion about who the VP pick is. So you wonder what the difference is. The difference is it's not 
not a white man. Um, and so people have lots of opinions. Um, we've actually gone one step further because obviously our work is around um, electing um, and, and, and amplifying black women's leadership. We are actually saying that there are not just one, but multiple black women that are on this short list right. um, that not only um, would be a, an asset to um, the ticket as a running mate, but also an asset in, um, um, in the administration. And so I'll bring Shirley Chisholm back. For those who could see, I actually have a, a, a printer over my shoulder. So not only was she the first black woman to ever serve in Congress, she also ran in 1972, 48 years ago, for president. And so this time, actually this past Monday, July 13th, is the anniversary of her name being entered into nomination from the floor in the Democratic um, Convention in 1972. So there's been obviously leaps and gains from her boldly stepping off the sidelines running for um, from president in 1972 to now being a VP, um, talking about Vice President Pete Picks, or as we're calling Veep Stakes. Right. There, are, there is a handful of Black women. They all come from different experiences, different backgrounds, and they all bring something different as a running mate in, in the administration. So, you know, regardless if he picks a woman or a woman of color, this is significant for a variety of reasons. One, there's a discussion around, well, would a woman of color or Black woman actually enhance the ticket, particularly if Black women are going to overwhelmingly vote for um, the Democratic um, candidate? I would say two things. Over the last couple of cycles, data points actually to, yes, a Black woman will create an extra enthusiasm among Black women um, um, on the ticket as voters. Uh, and in the investment in a Black woman voter is we don't go to a polls alone. So not only is she going to be enthusiastic, she will also bring others to the polls and overperform, and, and African Americans will probably overperform. But we've already seen data points to, um, out of the five black women who were just elected to Congress in 2018, four of them came from districts that are districts that are majority white. And so that shows that um, um, they can build a winning coalition of voters that are, are not of color. Um, and so not only can a black woman or woman of color excite women of color, she will also bring most likely white women um, and bring enthusiasm in their ability to vote when, when there is a a clear discussion around what will white women do in 2020 as voters, as swing voters. Great. Um, and I, I want to take some questions from the audience. So if you haven't had a chance to type in a question, please uh, go ahead and do that. Um, and Amanda, I, uh, I want to start with you on one of these questions um, from Joanne. Um, she uh, has a question about your word cloud. Um, and she wanted to know if, um, does the word cloud show words that are helpful in stump speeches? And I know you all have done a lot of research on um, messaging around for women candidates and what's effective in that sense. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and that's a great question, Joanne. What we found regarding women introducing themselves to voters is that it's critical for women to lead with their qualifications. And there's a temptation to tell the story of their bio and the nice kind of origin story. But women don't have that luxury because women are not assumed to be qualified and particularly women of color need to emphasize their qualifications even more. So we would recommend to anyone that's writing a stump speech or introduction to voters to, if it feels like you're highlighting your qualifications too much, it's not too much. It's probably not enough because voters need to hear, they need to hear action-oriented language and they need to hear how women got results. It's not just enough for women to say, I owned a small business. They need to be able to say, I owned a small business and I created X amount of jobs. I balanced a budget. So highlighting those tangible results over and over. And then also, of course, talking about a candidate's personal story. Um, and one more, uh, another question for you um, about some of the research um, from Susan Littman. She said, the qualifications deemed necessary for women leaders are qualities we would want in any leader, obviously being compassionate, humanistic, empathetic, et cetera. Um, how are these qualifications different from what voters want in men? She's asking. That's a great question. And that's absolutely right. There are a number of qualities that voters want regardless of a leader. The difference is that voters assign some benefits to women because voters assume that women have more empathy. Voters know that women are good listeners. And voters see that while 
men might be able to come in decisively and kind of laser focus and take charge, women are really taking a broader view and looking at how the entire community is affected. And that's certainly what we've seen across the country in the past seven months with the COVID crisis and all of the protests across the country as well. Um, Glenda, let me ask you this question from Ab Abdul and um, maybe expand on a couple more elements of this, but he's asking what strategies can be used if the voters themselves are racist and refuse to provide opportunity to women? And I guess I would just expand on that and ask you um, to talk in general about sort of the anti-racist discussions that are happening um, now and their impact on, on politics and, and the way we look at um, political participation. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think across the country, I mean, one of the ways we can combat that is being able to have candid and frank and open conversations with our networks and our families. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes when you talk, talk about um, voters being racist or um, sexist, I would assume that there are many people in our own network who don't believe that their behavior would, would label them either of those two. So being able to, like I've seen in my social feed, um, more of my friends having very overt conversations about their experiences as women and as African-Americans, and then at the intersection <laughs> of being an African-American woman. Um, and, and frankly, I think there are some conversations, particularly as it relates to voters and electing women and women of color, that we also have to rethink how we vote. We have historically voted for older white men. And so if we use the example, we started the presidential um, um, uh, election with the most diverse field of Democratic candidates, well, candidates ever, but on the Democratic side. And at the end of the day, there were coded language around electability and likability, which um, points to the Barbara Lee um, Family Foundation's research. And, and frankly, that, that discussion about electability and likability didn't just come from white men. Um, it came from women, women of color, and Black women, right? And so we have to push ourselves from a voter's perspective to really um, determine, you know, what types of qualifications we want in our leadership, um, and are we, un you know, unconscious or consciously putting in um, gender and cultural biases around what type of leadership, right? To be able to hear, I've heard a thousand of people, because like I said, we've called um, in, in, in making, um, encouraging that the vice president she, should be a black woman. And we've heard from black women who want to see more black women in elected office, that the stakes are too high for us to chance having a black woman on the ballot, mm -hmm. right? Um, because that black woman could then you know, that, that, that um, white voters won't vote for her and that frankly that, um, that black voters might not vote for her. And so I always say that at the end of the day, we wanna imagine, um, all we have to do is imagine the possibilities that exist for what our leadership looks like. At the end of the day, Americans want economically thriving, educated, healthy, and safe communities. And who are the leaders that are best equipped to do that? Um, and they may come in the form of leaders that don't look who um, like the historic leaders that have led our country. Um, and so I would say it is us internally assessing how we perceive leadership um, and leadership that is, um, that is diverse, excuse me, and for us to continue to have and push our network um, networks to be very clear um, around their unconscious bias around women's leadership. Great, thank you for that. Um, Brianna, let me ask you this question uh, from Dennis, uh, who says, uh, about half of all women run businesses are controlled by women of color. Do you believe this significant participation in the economy will provide more opportunities for women of color to reach management and CEO levels in large businesses and corporations? And I guess maybe is, the, is there a parallel um, in the political world for that uh, as well? There is a parallel. Um, I know we've talked about many young women candidates, candidates of color who are starting to run. 2018, we elected the most diverse Congress, which was incredibly exciting. Dennis, that stat that you shared is exciting. At the same time, we need to acknowledge structural and systemic barriers that exist. Glenda was talking about likability being coded language, the way that maybe we consciously or unconsciously view, assess, and criticize candidates. I was looking through some of these comments and 
I know uh, one of these individuals mentioned that, you know, we assess everything from the way this person's hair looks, the way their makeup looks. Is she smiling? Is she not smiling? Did someone catch her on an off day? Does that mean that she's unqualified? And I think the same can be said for, you know, the business world. It is a reflection of our culture and our values. And some challenges that we see as women look to rise in any field is these barriers that have been set up, whether it's um, people who are looking at performance reviews, we know that women are not giving clear feedback where people definitely hold back from giving concrete advice on how they can advance for fear of hurting their feelings or for fear of not knowing how to address someone that doesn't look like you. Maybe the boss might not necessarily look like the person that they're managing and they shy back from giving concrete feedback that could help that person you know, advance in their career. To this present day, we don't see a large number of women who are part of corporate board seats in those boardrooms. Individuals of color, they're not being part of those conversations, making important decisions. So I think that statistic is exciting where there's a lot of interest, but we need to assess gaps and definitely acknowledge that these systems are created with barriers in mind. And if we want people of color and more diverse individuals to rise, we need to address our own roles in them and how we can break down what has you know, existed for decades and if not hundreds of years in whether systems of politics or systems of business. Amanda or Glenda, do either one of you wanna add anything to that? I would say that women of color uh, in uh, the world around Black women, we, we again put more into, um, into uh, society than we get back. And so we um, rotate more economic dollars, we start more businesses, um, and we, we disproportionately vote more. And so the question is, how do we change systems, um, perceptions, uh, and create opportunities for us to then step into the leadership roles um, without um, institutional barriers and man-made obstacles. Um, Amanda, did you want to add anything to that? Well, I'll just say that in our 2017 Opportunity Knox research, we mm -hmm. found that voters were very open to first-time women candidates and particularly women of color first-time candidates who had owned a small business in their community. So, if there are women out there that are operating a business that are thinking about running for office but think I've never held office, I've never run for office before, voters were certainly enthusiastic about translating the skills of owning a small business to serving in office. Um, great. Um, let me ask, um, see who wants to weigh in on this question uh, from Paola, um, who asks, uh, thank you very much for your research and insight. Not all women want to run for office and choose to take instead advisory roles. Uh, is there any research on women chiefs of staff or women in high positions of influence within a political administration and their role in times of crisis in general? And I do think we've, we've certainly seen um, women taking the lead in different organizations, um, your organizations, uh, Black Lives Matter, um, the, I know the DCCC uh, is, is headed up by a woman. Uh, and so um, what are your thoughts on sort of women behind the scenes um, really working in politics but not actually running themselves? Who wants to take that? Well, I'll just say one thing that we talked about on gender on the ballot in the COVID crisis are all of the women that are public health officials that have mm -hmm. suddenly taken a center stage in the COVID crisis. And we've also seen a lot of those women face a backlash, in part probably due to misogyny that their male counterparts haven't faced. But we've also seen a lot of the women in the public health leadership resonate with voters. And some of our focus groups for this research, actually, voters were very enthusiastic talking about some of the women that were in those roles. So that's one way that women kind of plugging along behind the scenes can suddenly be front and center. And we've also found kind of informally, anecdotally in our governor's research, because we've studied every gubernatorial race involving a woman candidate since 1998, that it's so important to have a diversity on the staff of a campaign. And having representation really ensures that a candidate is able to take a 360 degree view and not fall into some of the traps that candidates fall into when their entire campaign staff looks the same way and looks the same way as them. Yeah. And I would say there's an, there is an, also an increase in black women, I mean, women uh, and black women um, serving um, 
in, in these roles. So I'll use the presidential um, uh, election as an example. So, you know, Donna Brazil was one of the first black women to ever run a presidential campaign. This cycle, you had, um, you know, Secretary Castro's um, campaign manager was a black woman. You have senior advisors to the Democratic nominee as uh, black women. You see there's black women serving in roles that historically, you know, oftentimes you would see women of color that would be um, assigned to roles around organizing constituencies of color. You now see press secretaries, you see policy um, 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 policy uh, um, advisors and analysis. Um, you see campaign chairs, you know, Kamala Harris had her sister who is a, you know, a policy um, thought leader in her in herself being a campaign chair. And so you will see more and more black women and women of color leading in these um, roles. And also frankly, um, raising money and giving money to um, political um, organizations and political candidates. The Hill has an increase in the number of black women serving in, um, in senior, senior roles. Um, so I always say that, you know, not all of us need to run. I know for a fact that I don't want to be an elected official, um, but we all have a role to play. And that may be just organized, no, I shouldn't say just, um, that it could be you organizing your network to the polls, using your voice to talk about an issue that you're inspired about opening up your pocketbook or your wallet and supporting candidates that inspire you and organizations um, that you believe in um, to you stepping off the sidelines in the spirit of Shirley Chisholm and running unbought and embossed to you being an advocate. Um, you know, democracy does not begin and end on election day. Um, and that is one of the mistakes of, um, of, of our American de and democracy. People will go vote and that is the work that they do. At the end of the day, I was the chief of staff of a New York state senator at a time where there weren't many um, other um, chiefs that looked like me. Um, at the end of the day, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Um, and that is about you having direct dialogue with your elected official, may it being you emailing, you know, in the new world, tweeting at them, making appointments in, in lobbying and going um, um, on lobbying trips with organizations you believe in um, and having conversations with them during town halls. And so you can find a leadership role for you um, um, if you're watching this. Um, in any of those variety of ways. Um, we are stronger together and when we all participate in our American um, democracy, I believe that we will have a stronger union. Brianna, do you wanna add anything to that about Latina women? Absolutely, I think, you know, it was incredibly exciting to see very talented, amazing Latinx women rise to become senior advisors. There were individuals on Julian Castro's team. There were individuals on, um, Beto O'Rourke's team and some of the other candidates who are running and just to really affirm everything that's been spoken, it's so important for individuals to be able to share their experiences, lift up their communities, be in those rooms, talk about the people who are not being talked about. I've been in some of those rooms as, you know, a young Latinx woman from a border community, and it's incredibly important for you to be there, share your experience, talk about things that you see matter, you bring a perspective that is so unique and different and is sometimes underrepresented or not even thought about at all. And it's something that needs to change. I love how Glenda mentioned, you know, you don't need to run for office, but you can be the campaign manager. You can be a policy analyst. You can be an advisor, someone on those teams knocking on doors for a candidate that you care about, collecting all your family and friends, raising funding for a local, you know, city council member. So democracy looks like a lot of different things. And I think, what would be exciting is for individuals to really, you know, pick and choose what works best for them and really dive into it so that way their communities are represented. That's great. Um, here's another question about sort of intersectionality um, from Janet uh, Youngblood. She says, uh, women have a hard time in our society, whether they are black, white, Asian, Hispanic, et cetera. This is a fact. It is a good idea. Is it a good idea to emphasize these categories when running or should the emphasis just be on being female? Um, and she says, I believe there is a loss of interest in the electorate when individuals stress ethnicity. Uh, what do you think? Does anyone wanna tackle that? Well, oh, go ahead, you can go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. mine's anecdotal. I'm sure yours is research based. <laughs> Well, I was just going to say, we definitely hear that in yeah. our focus groups from people, but the reality is that we all have a bias regardless of 
what we think we believe just based on the system that we've been exposed to our whole lives. And what's really changed when it comes to women running for office in the past several years is that women are running as their authentic selves. They're not trying to fit into an outdated template that for hundreds of years was dominated by older white men. So women are bringing the whole of their experience. If the whole of their experience includes being a woman of color, if it includes being an LGBTQ candidate, they're bringing that with them because they're bringing that with them to work every day. And as we've been talking about, having a diversity of voices at the table allows our government to see the, the spots in the population that aren't being served during a crisis and having voices at the table as Glinda was saying early on, like Lauren Underwood, for example, right. was able to talk about the, the uh, maternal deaths that have been happening in childbirth and propose historic legislation as someone coming from a healthcare background and as a black woman who, who has knowledge of this issue. It's another reminder why representation matters. And it's, it's part of who candidates are no matter how they talk about it. And when we do our research, it's important for us to understand how voters think about women from different backgrounds so that women can have the tools to run smart when they do campaign. Yeah, and I would just add to, to that, I should have went first because she pretty much said everything <laughs> I was gonna say. But um, at the end of the day, like our identities are important. And so I think where you see campaigns misfire is when, um, we r try to run women of color as white candidates and particularly white men candidates because then there's that disconnect of what she's not authentic um she seems contrived or, or or you know scripted that at the end of the day it is interesting that there's a discussion around identity politics when there's a rise in in the diversity of those who are running in politics so identity politics worked when it was you know just a handful um it is hard to separate yourself um your identity um, and you should lean into that. I mean, I would never advise a candidate to be like, well, let's, you know, you look back. I remember that there would be advisors ex um, telling um, um, black women candidates, you know, to soften themselves and all, and those are codes around, you know, wear your hair straight, don't wear it natural, um, don't wear these types of earrings or these, you know, all of these things that w could make um, voters feel, you know, the notion is my goal is, my goal as a black woman is not to create a comfortable environment for others, right? Um, I need to bring my, my authentic self to the decision-making tables. And, and at the end of the day, the reason why you see this overwhelmingly um, um, embrace of the black women who are um, leading during COVID-19 and the uprising since um, Memorial Day is because they're showing up in their very authentic selves. Um, um, and that is why I think they resonate. Um, and I, and I, I believe that we all should be leaning into um, our identity um, and, and the intersection of that at politics. I will argue that one individual who I think does this incredibly well um, as a Latina candidate is Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Mm -hmm. She shows up to these meetings where, you know, there would have been advisors who would have told her, do not wear your red lipstick, do not wear hoop earrings. Right. watch your tone, make sure you don't come off as like an angry Latina woman. And she is fierce. She's dominant. Her base rallies around her, especially when she calls out individuals on Twitter. They know that it's her tweeting. Her message is authentic. Her voice is real. She's showing up as her true self. And I think she has, you know, actually opened doors for other individuals to show up as their true selves and, you know, wear red lipstick, even as a young member of Congress, be bold, be loud and come prepared. Great. Um, let's see, I think we have time for maybe one more quick question. Uh, this is from Linda. Um, and she says, can you comment on the Democratic primary and the women candidates? Um, I know, Glenda, you, you mentioned that a little earlier, but I'm wondering if anybody else um, has some thoughts on sort of what we saw in the primary process as t in terms of six women running, um, ending up with the final two um, being older white men. <laughs> um, but um, how important was it the fact, the fact that we had six women on that debate stage? Amanda, I know we talked a lot about this. So um, maybe just share your thoughts a little bit um, on that as well and what it, what it means for the future. Sure. I, I mean, as Betsy said, we had six women at one point on the presidential debate stage, which in history, there had only ever been six women before on the debate stage. And 
all of the women were alone prior to this year. So to have six women being able to contrast with each other as individuals rather than being the token woman expected to speak for her whole gender was very powerful. And certainly a lot of folks were disappointed, especially women in organizations that seek to advance women's political parity that we did not end up with a woman nominee, but that doesn't mean that we didn't have any progress at all. Our founder, Barbara Lee, always likes to focus on the positive and where we have gains and reminds us that the suffrage movement took 70 years. And the fact that there's a whole generation that is going to grow up not remembering seeing an incredibly diverse presidential primary debate stage is important. We also saw each of those women held to a different high and higher standard again and again on the campaign trail and faced criticism that their male counterparts did not. But I think the difference was that people were talking about that this time around. And in the past, there was not the same type of open dialogue about the different standard that women are held to when they seek executive office. So it certainly was progress. And what we're seeing with the talk around the VP candidate, who we don't know who it is yet, is that already there's an expectation for this woman to be incredibly qualified and held like a woman, right? <laughs> standard than, than men, not even knowing who she is that, who yeah. she is yet. And I think we're going to continue to see that when this woman is announced. You know, there is no perfect candidate. We don't have any perfect candidates in any race. And already it seems like this woman is expected to be perfect. And so we're waiting to see how she is held to different and higher standards on the campaign trail. That's a good point. Glenda or Brianna, do you, either of you have any thoughts on that or any final thoughts before we leave? No, I think that is, uh, um, is uh, a correct analysis. I would also just add that some of the lessons learned will be around how do we tackle um, the question around electability. Uh -huh. um, and so that plagued many of the women on that stage, right? Is, is, is she going to be electable? And the problem is when you start um, creating a narrative around electability, um, it then has a domino effect. When you start questioning it, it then um, slows like down her ability to raise money. Yeah, it's right? like a popular issue too. The more you talk about it, the more it becomes a, a reality. Yeah, and so I think there we've been having these conversations, you know, from you know early on in the primary of the 2018 um, gubernatorial election um, in Georgia. Um, Stacey Abrams went from people's questions, could a black woman be electable in the Deep South, to her ending the year as the most, you know, talked about um, politician in mounting um, what, you know, I still believe is a successful, um, you know, um, successful election and, and blueprint. So I think this election provides a blueprint. Um, her, her, her campaign in 2018 and the presidential campaign, a, a whole new playbook on how black, how black women, women, and women of color um, will be running for executive office. Brianna, thank you for pinch hitting today. So I'm going to give you the last word. <laughs> yes, I think, you know, 2020 was an important moment to see so many qualified, competent women, women of color up on the stage. What would be an important learning lesson for us and for us all to consider is how vicious cancel culture is, how it ripped to shreds every single one of those women who is running for candidate and how we are spending so much time thinking, assessing, reviewing this individual who will become the vice president compared to a white male who is now the nominee. We're spending so much time thinking about his women you know, VP pick compared to someone who's actually running for president. So I think just acknowledging the biases that are in our culture, how we see women and the expectations that we have for them, whether they're running for office or in business, in politics, really at every step of the level and how it weighs even more unfairly for women of color. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll all be watching that. So um, that's a good note to end on. Thank you, um, all of you, for um, participating in the panel. And thank you to the audience. It's always terrific. Uh, talk to our friends at NYU. And thanks for having this discussion. And uh, enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, sure. everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.